Thank you and welcome. Uh, today I want to talk about event-based API patterns and practices. Just a bit about myself before we get started. My name is James Higginbotham. I'm an executive API consultant. I focus on API architecture, strategy, and execution. Primarily, I help organizations establish, grow, and mature their API programs, and also offer training around API design and API product management. I'm based in Colorado Springs, and I've worked across a variety of verticals over my consulting career, including commercial insurance, healthcare, hospitality, finance and banking, travel, and even helping to get a startup airline off the ground, literally. I think it's always important to remind ourselves first and foremost that API design is an architectural concern. It spans business, product design, and software engineering disciplines. And as such, we really have to step back and take a viewpoint of all of these elements together. We can't just dive into code. We can't just dive into the technical details. We have to look at all the different aspects and put them together to understand how to best deliver an API. Now, today we know that REST APIs are predominantly the style of API that we see. We're seeing uh, growth in GraphQL and gRPC as well, as far as API protocols are concerned but we're now seeing a lot of growth in the async API space, combining EDA, event-driven architecture, with APIs and externalizing a lot of our events and notifications outside of our organization, or at least outside of a closed system to other parts of the organization. Oftentimes we see the need for event-driven notification by way of API polling. This is where we have an application, an API, interacting with one another. So the application asks the API, hey, are there any updates to the data? And the API says, nope, nothing's changed. And then a little bit later, the app says, hey, any updates now? And the API says, nope, still nothing. And likewise, the app says, any updates? Nothing. Any updates? Oh yeah, here you go. Uh, here's a message that it contains some of the update details. And uh, according to a, a poll that was conducted several years ago, 98.5% of polling API requests send back data that hasn't changed. So we're increasing the need for our infrastructure and the cost of that infrastructure to support all the traffic necessary to determine has there been an update to some element of data that our API is responsible for. So there has to be a better way and there is. Before we look at that though, I wanna step back a bit and just review some messaging concepts because this is gonna help us understand the different options that are available to us and when we might want to choose one particular async API style over another. So when we think about uh, exchanging messages between APIs, whether they're synchronous, REST-based, or whether they're async, they're event-driven or event notification style, there are primarily three types of messages that we interact with. The first is a command message, where we have a component, the message producer, sending a command to another component, perhaps asking it to calculate a 30-day sales average. And so we have that command that's sent to another component that receives it and acts and provides a response back. So that's our first type of message, a command message, where we tell a component that we wanna do something. Now, it could be that these components are directly communicating with one another, or we have things like message brokers in between. We also have a reply message. This is where we have a component that's a message receiver that's waiting to get a reply back from perhaps a command message itself. So. In this case of the first command message, we're gonna have a reply message that's sent back. So component B does the work of calculating the 30-day sales average and then sends back the report data on some predetermined schedule or on some uh, asynchronous response back. So we have this reply message. So command and reply messages. The third kind that we have is an event message. This is where we tell someone when something's happened. So component A decides that it wants to say that the 30-day sales average has been updated and component B is interested in knowing that. So there's a more of an event driven notification here. So those are the three types of messages that we oftentimes deal with in APIs. When we think about messages in practice, we sometimes don't realize that our web APIs are exchanging messages all the time. We're designing messages when we design web APIs. We'll have an HTTP request, we'll send a command message to an API server and then we'll get a response back. And that command message is comprised of some protocol semantics about HTTP, whether using HTTP 1.1, 2, or 3. And then we'll have the request body as well. So the combination of the protocol details of the get, the path, the header fields, 
and in the request body come up with a command message. So every time we're sending an HTTP request, we're really issuing a command message to an API server. The API server likewise is sending a reply message back. It's using the protocol semantics of HTTP to send back the response code, the content type, and oftentimes a response body that contains the details about what was requested in the command message. So we're oftentimes exchanging command messages and reply messages already. So we're kind of already thinking in terms of that, particularly with our synchronous APIs where we send requests and get a response immediately back. When we think about event messages, however, we are addressing a different need. We're answering questions like what happened, who did it happen to, and why did it occur? So these notifications take on a different meaning. This isn't asking us to do something. This is informing us of something that has already happened. So one example could be when someone subscribes or unsubscribes from my newsletter, API Developer Weekly, and I get notified in a Slack channel about that. So that's one event example that I might have. It just tells me how many unsubscribes or subscribes have I had in a particular period of time. Another example might be something you're familiar with with GitHub, and we send a pull request. The pull request has details about who it was submitted by and the commit hashtag and all kinds of other details, the details about that particular pull request and how many commits are involved and so on. So this is something that's already happened and now we're being notified that it has occurred. In this case, we've oftentimes used in the EDA world, traditional message brokers that have queues and topics. And with queues, we deal with point to point messaging. So a component sends a message to a message broker and that message broker will distribute that message to one of the components that subscribe to that queue. So one message gets delivered to one component unless that component fails, in which case the broker will recover and send it to another component if that, if that component happens to go offline for some reason. We also have the option of fan out or pub sub using topics. So in this case, the publisher sends a message and all subscribers are notified about that message. So in event-driven architecture, we've leveraged these patterns for decades. These have been integration patterns. We've used them all the time but we haven't necessarily applied them to APIs successfully. Some have and some haven't. Likewise, we have now this emergence of distributed logs. These distributed logs made popular by Apache Kafka and Apache Pulsar and others uh, have a topic that allow us to combine the fan out method of allowing one or more subscribers to be notified when messages occur, but also we have the playback feature. So we get this historical record that we can go back and replay, allowing us to run code and perform different kinds of calculations and analytics against historical records as well as new records or messages as they are uh, posted into that topic. So it takes that topic concept and adds in this historical record element as well. So let's take these patterns we've talked about and start thinking about how we can shift our APIs into more of an event driven style of interaction. Uh, the first thing that we need to do is look at the different API styles that are available to us today. One of the most popular is webhooks. Webhooks allow us to have a component that will send an HTTP post when we need to notify a subscriber of an event. So it allows different systems to communicate with one another. We see this oftentimes in solutions such as WebEx and Slack and others that have messaging platforms that want to be able to notify some external system when a new message is received. In that case, we might have a messaging application that says that there's a particular person named Ash that asks, can you please review this particular thing that I've just created? And we send a message and that triggers a webhook dispatcher to send an HTTP post to some subscriber that is previously subscribed. That webhook receiver then receives that post, gets that structure, that message, oftentimes in JSON, but could be another format, and perhaps sends that into a workflow engine that determines that something needs to occur. Julie then says, okay, yeah, I've looked at this message and it looks good and I'm going to improve it. So I'm going to mark it as approved. And the workflow engine captures that approval state and then dispatches likewise a webhook to any kind of receiver, which could be the original messaging app or some other application as well. So it could be completely different components or the same component communicating between each other using these HTTP posts. And we get that webhook receiver, which receives the JSON and then can process that as well. So that is a very popular mechanism of doing server to server. Now, obviously we can't do this inside of a browser because our browsers can't stand up and listen to a specific 
HTTP call, it can only initiate calls. It can't receive them. So in that case, uh, we would use this for server-to-server -server communication. So we see this a lot in messaging platforms. There's also another thing called server sent events, or SSE. Server sent events is a way to allow us to kind of have more of a RESTful style approach or HTTP based approach. It's monodirectional, meaning that the client connects and then it's up to the server to push messages, but the client can't really do much else beyond that. So in this case, we have an application that connects to a, an SSE endpoint and may even specify its last event ID of the last message that it saw. And then the API can start sending responses back and we can send it in any format. It can be plain text, it could be JSON inside the data, and we can have different channels or event types that allow us to differentiate between them. So we can connect and then start receiving message after message after message after message over time. WebSocket is another way to approach this, but this is a slightly different variation on SSE. WebSockets actually use a bi-directional communication protocol inside of an HTTP connection. So we first initiate an HTTP connection and we request the server to perform an upgrade and upgrade to a WebSocket based connection. So we initiate with HTTP, but then we want to go into a sub protocol that allows us to communicate directly without having to exchange HTTP headers from then on. So we do an upgrade request and if the uh, API server is capable of doing WebSockets, it will return a 101 and do a handshake and indicate that the connection has been upgraded and all is good and we're now in the WebSocket world. So now we have WebSockets enabled and then we can send messages like hello server and hello client or we can send JSON back and forth or whatever we want that sub protocol to be. So that allows our API consumer or API client or app to communicate in any sub protocol that that API server supports and it can send messages and receive messages back and forth. With the introduction of GraphQL subscriptions, we're also seeing a lot of live data come in so we can have a GraphQL client subscribe to a specific message type by specifying in the function or the subscription message some particular arguments and specify what it wants the response payload to look like and then it will receive data structures as they come in. So GraphQL is starting to offer that kind of capability as well. GRPC, as we may know, builds on HTTP2 and the ability for bi-directional communication. So it's actually using uh, streaming either one way or two ways. One way we can do it is we can have the client stream to the server. So if the client has data, but it needs to be able to send it progressively and it wants the server to start performing actions as those messages are sent, the client can stream those messages and the server can take action on them as they go until the client says, I've streamed everything that I have, then the server can send a response back. So that's option number one inside of gRPC. Option number two is if the server streams back to the client. So the client makes a connection, sends its details in, and then the server is going to stream the responses back. So that's option number two. Option number three, gRPC can actually have bi-directional streaming. So in this case, the client can stream, the server can stream, and they can happen at any time. So whereas option one is the client streaming until it's done, and option two is the server streaming until it's done, option three gives us bi-directional communication. So we're starting to see some of these different API styles emerge that allow us to communicate in an asynchronous way, either with a server push or with event notifications originating from the server via an HTTP post using things like webhooks. So with that, we also need to start looking at how do we design our API events as well. So let's talk a bit about some design patterns now that we understand some of the style options that are available to us. Tim Bray had a post in 2019, which I thought was, was really eye-opening for a lot of people. It says, if you're going to start emitting events from a piece of software, put just as much care into the event design as, as you would do in specifying an API, because event formats are a contract too. A lot of organizations that I consult to have not really taken this step, whether you're using AWS SQS, SNS, and we're exchanging messages, whether you're using a traditional message broker, uh, if you're using distributed logs like uh, Apache Kafka or Pulsar, Whatever you might be using, it's important to capture, document, and manage those events and put a bit of governance around it to make sure that you don't break the consumers of that event later on. To do that, we know that the async API is a great way to be able to define and manage our structures. And there are multiple versions now of async API, and, and it has gone undergone quite a bit of growth and collaboration 
Uh, it's now uh, managed uh, by the Linux Foundation and has a lot of people contributing to it. It can be used to capture and define the messages exchanged with your message brokers and with your various async APIs. So one of the design patterns that we might want to look at when we're thinking about how we structure and then how we capture our message design is thin event notification. In this case, um, we broadcast only the necessary details to notify that an event has occurred. And that oftentimes will force the subscribers to fetch additional details to complete the task. So in this case, we're letting people know what happened, but we're not giving them all of the data. It's up to them to go use some sort of API, typically a synchronous API like REST or GraphQL to go fetch the most recent details. So we wanna use that when we wanna prevent subscribers from processing stale data. We wanna let them know something happened, but force them to fetch that data when they're ready to process it to prevent us from having stale data processed. One thing that we can do to extend this a bit is to add hypermedia. So in the case of a thin event, we might actually wanna add hypermedia links to inform the event consumer what the API operation is and then specifically the URL to get to it uh, to interact with and fetch those particular details. So we could offer details about the event itself and how to fetch this event representation later. We could actually point people to things like a customer when a customer address changes and they could go fetch the latest thing. So bringing in hypermedia into our events gives us a lot of power and helps us to bridge our event notifications with existing APIs that will return the state that they may want to use to process this event. Design pattern number three, event carried state transfer. This is really just a, a, a fancy term for saying broadcasting all the data at the time of the event. So this is a contrast to the thin event where we only say that this event occurred, but force them to go get the data. Instead, this event contains everything necessary for that subscriber to conduct further work. We wanna use this when subscribers want a snapshot of the data at the time of the event change. This is really common when we're dealing with message streaming, such as Kafka and Pulsar, where we wanna replay message history. We want to have a series of events that capture the exact data at that point in time. And as we replay those events, we get to see those changes occur over time. We're not getting just the latest data, we're getting the incremental data state changes. So this is oftentimes used in event sourcing, um, sometimes plays well with CQRS architectural styles that may be happening inside the API implementation. Design pattern number four is structured event payloads. I oftentimes see a very flat structure with events. It starts off with, here's an event type, here's the event ID, here's a few other details about the event, and then here's a few fields that are interesting. And then over time, we add more uh, fields and more fields and more fields. And these properties grow and evolve over time and it makes it really hard to understand something. So you start getting fields like billing address line one, billing address line two, because everything's very flat and it makes it hard to parse and manipulate. So looking at and structuring your event payloads to nest grouped fields together, making those properties cohesive and underneath a parent affords the consumer the ability to reuse structures like a, an address structure and they could reuse that for billing and mailing address and we can unify and uh, make it easier to interact with our events as well as our APIs. So bringing that kind of structure together or dealing with one-to-many relationships as part of the event payload. So this is really important for an event carried state transfer where you're going to be conveying a lot of state all at once instead of a thin event notification where you're only conveying very minimal information. Design pattern number five, evolutionary event schema. We have to recognize that our events are gonna change over time. We're gonna add new payload properties that have default values that aren't required. Uh, we don't wanna delete existing properties and we don't wanna rename property names that would cause problems with subscribers. Otherwise, you're gonna to have to version your events and then you have two different topics for two different versions and it becomes very difficult and unwieldy to deal with. So use uh, this of evolutionary event schema pattern whenever you need to make changes by making sure you don't introduce breaking changes. That may mean that you have to live with specific field names for some period of time. But in this case, we have to be very, very careful about breaking changes in our event schemas. Design pattern number six, offline and error recovery support. This is a big one that's oftentimes missed when we start going to async APIs. We need to be able to supplement our event notification channels to allow offline consumers to play catch up. Uh, our consumers may be offline because of a failure on their side, 
or maybe they're just trying to conserve uh, infrastructure costs and they only want to receive the events for specific periods of time and process them all at once and do it in a batch style. So we need a way to be able to recover if these consumers are not online at the time. So to do that, we might have some sort of dashboard to uh, allow you to see what events have occurred and to troubleshoot what kinds of events your system may have missed because of some error processing on your side or that you were offline and make sure that, that you're able to get caught back up. It could also be some sort of API integration as well that allows us to do that. One way that I've seen this done is with those server side events. We could use SSC to kind of get ourselves caught up a bit. So we could support recovery in the API itself, not just via dashboard for manual, manual intervention or manual troubleshooting, but we could also build it into the API. So if we have an app and an API and we connect in and say, this is the last message we saw, we can get caught up with all of the messages that have, we've been received between some period of time. And then if we have a network issue where we get disconnected and we need to reconnect, we can reconnect again and let the uh, API know what the last message ID was and it can help us to get caught up again. So there's ways that we can automate that process. Design pattern number seven, separate internal and external events. When we think about designing our events, we have to be careful about what we're designing them for. There's a lot of internal event details that we might want to suppress from an external consumer. So we don't want to necessarily leak that. If we're conducting credit card transactions, we may have all kinds of internal transaction IDs, merchant IDs, all kinds of different details about the authorization mechanism that we use that we may want to suppress and just actually externalize the event that a payment was processed and here's the order ID it's related to and here's how much it was for and so on. So we want to use this kind of pattern when we're managing or bridging our EDA internally with some sort of external async API. So be careful about taking an event that you already have in place internally and just immediately exposing that via an API. You may need to do some uh, design work to think about uh, how you want to prevent leaking implementation details. Now, uh, here's a bonus one, and we're going to get into a little bit of what we have been seeing lately with the emergence of ChatGPT, LLMs, AI, all of this kind of world that's happening in this growth of agent-based services. We may need to start thinking about stateful session support in our async APIs. In this case, we need to be able to uh, offer an interaction model that allows for longevity of an interactive, interactive session for these kind of LLM backed services or where we're using an agent to do things that are long term and not just immediate. A lot of the APIs that exist today to interact with these machine learning style APIs are very simple. They're request response. Here's some information. Give me something back. Here's a he says, set a data or context, give me what you think this uh, sentiment is for this text. But there are now emerging with ChatGPT these long running sessions. And you could imagine having agents that are monitoring real time data and looking for certain things that have been expressed in natural language. And we want to get notified every time something new shows up because new data has emerged. We may want to use a combination of REST and server sent events where we post to a chat sessions resource collection get a new resource instance with some sort of unique ID, and we post with it some sort of natural language expression, and then we can connect to the messages generated from that chat session to get pushed new messages as we receive them. So we could use SSC, we could use WebSockets, we could use anything like that. So in this case, what we're doing is we're using resource collections and resource instances to establish a session. The resource instance represents the session, and then that session could be a one-way chat with a bunch of SSE events that come back as the backend system starts figuring things out and wants to stream them over. On the back end, this is representing a session that is building up context over time with LLM back services or any kind of other machine learning system. Another option is bi-directional. In this case, we might use WebSockets for that. We would do the same kind of post to chat sessions, use the same URL, upgrade our connection for this particular session to a WebSocket and we would switch into WebSocket mode and then allow us to issue different queries to expand and add new information as we go. The messages that come back could be JSON-based, it could be free text, natural language, whatever it might be. As you become more comfortable with event-driven architecture, if you're new to it, or if you've been doing it for a while and you're starting to get into the async API world, you're gonna have an advantage when delivering high-value APIs that are driven by 
uh, LLMs and AI and machine learning and all these different elements. So that's it for today. Uh, I appreciate your time. I hope there's something here that you've learned, a nugget you can take back. Uh, please subscribe to a newsletter, apideveloperweekly.com. I do hand curation of really interesting API articles each week. They usually go out on Thursday afternoons, central time. So subscribe to that and let me know if you have any questions or if you'd like to follow up, drop me a message. Thanks.